Okay, here we go. Okay, so to see the recorded lectures, um, you can go to the whatever week you want to look at for the recorded lecture. So like week seven, I post it right here. So uh, for Monday, we have this lecture that's already posted. So you click on the link, it, it'll go to YouTube. And then you can see the lecture right there. And then I have a playlist for this class. So you can see all of the past lectures too, in a kind of more easy way. Yeah. Okay, so um, we're gonna have a quiz next Wednesday. So, you know, uh, there was a question earlier for how many quizzes we're gonna have in total. So I don't have any set amount, but I do wanna have a decent amount of quizzes for this class. So you don't just have, you know, five quizzes for the whole semester and that's it. So if you did bad on one or two, that would kind of suck. So we're gonna have at least a fair amount. Um, again, I don't have any specific total that I wanna get to like specifically, but let's say I wanna have around at least eight or something like that. So we'll have a quiz next Wednesday. Uh, and to kind of prepare you for the quiz, we're gonna have another homework. So I need to still make that homework, but I'll post it sometime today. And it'll technically be due by next Wednesday by 11.59 p.m. But I'll post the solutions on probably like Monday. So it's, uh, you know, technically you can just look at the solutions and just copy them for your homework credit. But I want to really recommend that. I want you to actually work through the homework on your own first, and then you can look at the solutions. But the homework is really used to to prepare you for the quiz and to give you more practice in, inside of MATLAB. So yeah, it's in your best interest to actually work on the homework yourself, uh, kind of work through any issues that you may have, and then you can look at the solutions to make sure that you did it right. And again, I only grade the homework on completion anyways, so I don't grade it on correctness. Okay, so any questions on any homeworks or the quiz? Uh, next week's quiz is going to be on plotting, by the way. So everything that we covered so far and everything that we're going to cover today, that'll be fair game for the quiz. So any questions? Okay. Uh, okay, so let's get started. So we're gonna finish plotting today. And so we don't have too many slides left. Um, we'll see. So if we finish the slides, then I'll probably just uh, I'll probably talk about how to import data. I'll start doing that today as well. I haven't made slides for that yet, but we can kind of just go over it by yourself and that'll be fine. All right, so I'm gonna have you work on this exercise here before we get started with new stuff. So I want you to make a plot. So you're gonna have two equations that you need to plot on the same graph. So you're gonna plot y1 and y2. So y1 equals five times sine of x. Y2 is three times cosine of two x. And again, you're gonna make that on the same plot. You're gonna have y1, that'll be a line with a, a red line with circles. And y2 will be a blue line with squares. And then you're gonna have an X domain from zero to five with a step size of 0 0.1. Say P line, red line. All right, so I'll give you a few minutes to work on that and then we'll, uh, again, get started on new stuff. Uh, maybe you should have a legend as well. That would be a good idea.
Okay, so I'll go through the solutions. Hopefully all of you finished it, but if not, uh, we're just gonna go through the solution together then. Okay, so I'm gonna make a little section here. Again, to make a section, we do 2% signs. We'll do, we'll do extra signs. Maybe I should put that above. Okay, so we got a plot Y1 and Y2 on the same plot from zero to five with a step size of 0 0.1. So I'll start up on making, <clears throat> sorry, I'll start up on making our X domain. That's gonna be zero, step size of 0, point, uh, 0 0.1. And then we're gonna go to five. We'll do Y1 equals five times sine of X. And Y2 equals three times cosine of two times X. All right, and then we're gonna make a plot. So let's do plot X comma Y1. We need that to be a red line with circle. So in apostrophes, I'm gonna put R, that stands for red, and then we need circle. So I'm gonna do an O. Um, however, I said I want a red line with circle, so I need to add in a, add in a dash. So if I just had RO right now, and then I plotted that, all right, I need to save the script. Class, what's, what's the date? It's the 10th, 7th. Okay. All right, so if I just run that, then right now we just have a plot with circles. So I said that I want to have this be a, a red line with circles. So because of that, I need to add in a dash at the end. Okay, and then we have a red line with circles. All right, just pulling up the chat. Okay, so then we also need to add in Y2. So to do that, we're going to type in hold on. This way we can have two curves on the same graph. And then we're gonna plot X comma Y2. This we need a blue line with squares. So we'll do B for blue, S for squares, and then a dash, because we wanna align. All right, then we'll type and hold off since we're done plotting uh, for this graph. And we also want a legend. So we'll type in legend. Our first argument, that's going to be 5 times sine of x. So we'll do 5 sine of x. The second one is going to be 3 times cosine of 2x. So 3 times cosine of 2x. And remember our first legend entry, that's going to correspond to the first um, equation that we plotted. So that's y1. And the second entry for legend, that's going to correspond to the second plot that we made, which is y2. So now if we run that, now we have both plots on the same curve. And then you see in the legend as well, it, it's pretty nice. It shows us our, our line and it shows the data marker that we have on the line as well. Okay, any questions on this review? Okay. All right, so let's go on. So the first topic for today is gonna to be tick values and labels. So this will be of use for the project. Uh, so we're gonna have that uh, assigned next week, uh, probably next week. So, uh, so I wanna go over obviously the rest of plotting and then we're gonna go over importing data into the MATLAB, and then also uh, kind of manipulating the data as well. So I want to go through all of that before I assign the, the project. So next week is going to be really important, important when we import the data. So we're going to be using a function called read table, and that allows to have a table that has a lot of different uh, data types. And we can reference all of those data types uh, you know, in the same table. So usually if we had like an array, it would have to be the same data type, uh, whether it was like a, a numeric value or um, a, 
an array of date time. So date time, that's just, you know, the date and the time uh, kind of together. So um, anyways, we'll, we'll talk about it, but using, using a table is really convenient because then we can have everything together and just that one table and we can uh, make plots and we can reference the data in that table really easily. So uh, I wanna make sure that we go through that first. Okay, so tick values and labels. So we can modify our tick value and our tick label. So this graph is kind of small. All right, so we have this graph here. Um, and you'll see that on the X axis, I changed the tick labels that we have. So by default, it's gonna, it's just gonna be assigned to whatever MATLAB kind of thinks is best for the, for the tick values that we have. And the tick label is just going to be some numeric, uh, it's going to be a number. So here I have um, a graph of three times cosine of x. And I want to make this, you know, kind of convenient for us to look at where I'll have the tick spacing or the tick intervals in, a, in an interval of pi. And then I want to have the label shown as three times pi and two times pi. So we can do that. So here I have some code. It might be kind of small for you to read that. So we'll just go through this exercise here. So we're gonna do x equals one space uh, from negative 10 to 10. Okay, so that's gonna give us a, a x vector or a vector x that's going from negative 10 to 10. And by default, since we didn't specify any argument for the length of that vector, by default, MATLAB is going to make that a 1 by 100 double. I'm going to add it on the top to clear everything. All right. And let's also I'll just take that out. OK, so our function y is going to be 3 times cosine of x. And then we're going to plot, we're going to plot that. We'll make it green, sure. And then we'll do a line width of two because I always think that looks best. All right, did 1.5, but I'm gonna do two right now. Okay, so let's plot this. And by default, here we go. So we have our range is from negative 10 to 10, and we see that our ticks, our tick labels, they're just numbers right now. So maybe again we want to have them uh, show up as as a as pi, you know, negative three times pi, negative two times pi, etc. So we can do that. So I'm gonna go here and I'm gonna add in an argument. So I'm gonna type in x ticks, and this will basically specify the range of our tick values that we have. So for us, we're going from negative three pi to three pi. So I'll type in. Uh, x tick, so I first need to have a left parenthesis because that's my my command. My command is x tick, so we need to type out x ticks and then a parenthesis. And we're, inside of those parentheses, we have our argument. So we see here, type in x ticks, and then we get our little box here so we can look at the documentation. And there's a, there's quite a lot that you can do with these tick values. So um, kind of talked about this a bit last time, but I think their documentation is very useful to look at if you want to see um, all of the possibilities that you can do for some specific command. But that'll probably help out quite a lot for the project. If there's anything that you want to do that I didn't cover in the lecture. All right, so we have x ticks, and now I'm going to specify a vector here that I want to have. So I'm going to use a left bracket. So remember, since I'm specifying a vector, we need to enclose it in brackets. So, so that's where I have the bracket. And then I'm going to do negative 3 times pi. And I'll do negative 2 times pi. And we have negative pi. 0, pi, 2 times pi, and then 3 times pi. All right, so there's our vector. And then we want some, well, let's run this right now. So if I run it right now our tick values or tick labels, they changed. 
So I still have the same amount of ticks, but the actual ticket value changed to be representative of intervals of pi. So, so here, this is negative three times pi, negative two times pi, and then negative pi. Uh, you get it. So that's fine, but obviously we would want it to actually show the word pi, or not the word pi, but the but the symbol for pi. So we'll do x tick labels, and then we're going to specify the labels that we want. So again, since we have uh, and this is our command, we need to write out x tick labels, and then we're going to have parentheses, and inside of the parentheses, we're going to have our argument. This time, I'm going to use a I'm going to use curly braces because we're specifying a string. So remember, I talked about a string before. That's basically um, some kind of word or letters that we want to input into MATLAB. So it's not um, a numeric value that we're putting in. It's kind of something that you would uh, kind of write down, and we don't want MATLAB to process it like it's a number or some command. So, uh, so that's why we're going to put a uh, use curly braces here, and then inside of apostrophes, we're going to type in what we want to show up on the screen. So we're going to have negative three. And then here we have to do a backslash pi. So we have to do a backslash pi. So it's going to actually show up as the symbol pi and not just the, the word pi. So if I just had negative three and pi, then that would just show up as the word pi. So we have to do a backslash pi. We're going to do negative two backslash pi. We need to have a, you know, put these in apostrophes, and then we have a comma. Okay, so this part can be a little tedious, uh, but we're gonna, we're gonna do it. And then we have negative backslash pi. We have zero. And then we have backslash pi. Right, there we go. And then we have um, backslash two slash backslash pi, two, geez, two backslash pi, and then we have three backslash pi. There we go, and then we're gonna close that out with a right curly bracket, and then a right parentheses. Okay, so then if I run that, now we get our graph here, where it shows negative three pi, negative two pi, it shows up like we want it to, to show up. All right, so there we go. And so we could put a legend in here. I'm not going to go through that because we've gone through that before. So um, if we didn't want our ticks to be by intervals of just pi, we could also change that. So let's uh, let's take out negative 2 times pi and 2 times pi here. And then if I run it, then our ticks, they kind of update. So we have just negative three pi. And you, you see here it's showing negative two pi when really that should be uh, negative pi. So let's, uh, let's go back, run that. So it was doing that because we still have this vector for the x tick label. So we, we would have to take out negative two pi and, and two pi over here as well. I guess you kind of have to be careful for that. Um, okay. So I'm kind of thinking right now, um, I don't think I ever tried this. So thinking for, this is just something I'm curious about myself for X ticks, if we can just assign a regular, regularly spaced vector and in intervals of pi. So let's try that. We'll do negative three times pi. I want an interval of pi and then go to three times pi see if that works. All right, looks like it did work. Comment that out. Okay, so yeah, that's a more convenient way to define our vector. All right, there's an, a question. So if we use the auto option for our ticks, would, would those same ticks show up? Okay, so I think your question is, if I don't, if I just have x ticks commented out, but I have my x tick labels, 
uh, like that. Uh, so in this case, it's not going to be the same because MATLAB is determining its own way to define the tick labels. In this case, they are, or sorry, the ticks. So in this case, MATLAB wants to use more ticks than, than we defined ourselves. So, so in this case, no, it's, it's not going to show up correctly. Okay, so, so yeah, here I'd recommend to do it the way that I just did it here, where we defined a vector here. Oops, where we defined this vector. So from negative three, uh, three times pi, an interval of pi, and then we're going to three times pi. Uh, I don't think there's a way to do that with our with our strings here. I could be wrong. Why don't we try that as well? So obviously, as you can see, this part is a little new to me as well. I usually don't modify the tick values. So we'll do negative three. I don't think this will work, but we'll, again, we'll just try it. It's probably not going to work because we're defining a string here and we're trying to make a vector from a string. So I don't think that's going to work out. Uh, let's see, negative three times pi. I'd maybe have to do all in quotes here. Nah. Yeah, I'm pretty sure this won't work. We'll do three pi. Yeah, not gonna work. Okay. So we'll just take that out. Okay, so are there any questions on this right now? So you can define a vector for your x ticks, but you can't define a vector for, for the labels. You're actually gonna have to type those out as far as I know. Why did you take out the two pies? Uh, up up here, how I did yeah. that earlier. Uh, I just did that just to demonstrate that if we didn't want them for whatever reason, obviously that would be kind of weird, but we could take them out and have whatever kind of spacing we want for the for the x tick. So if I took out two times pi, and let's say I also want to take out negative pi and pi, all I want is negative three pi, zero and three pi. Uh, we could do that. Let me comment this one out. So we could do that, but and then I need to also get this one out. So we could just define our own ticks that we want to have on the graph. So maybe I didn't want to have negative two pi, negative pi, and pi and two pi. We could do that, but um, then you'd have to make sure that your tick labels correspond to that. Okay, any other questions? What if the curve what? You there, Josh? Hello? Yeah, I, I can hear you, but just barely. So what if the, um, what if the graph is, I, I know the graph is like in a, in, you know, card in one area, but what if it's like going down? Uh, I'm not really sure what you mean. Like if it was like an actual like you know a full length graph, it was like cut one Q one Q two Q three Q four. What if it was going down instead of it like going up and down? So you mean just having like a negative slope? Yeah. Um. So yeah, it'd, it'd just be the same thing. We could still define um our own tick spacing for that as well, but it would it would depend on whatever you're plotting. Okay. So if, if you want to look at that, you can stick around at the end and we can talk about it then. Okay. All right. I have one more question. How come okay. you put colons for the second X ticks, but not the first one? Yeah, good, good. that's a good question. So on this first one here, um, I just want to have these three values here. So negative three pi, zero and three pi. While the next one, I'm defining a vector. So I'm defining an evenly spaced vector. So I'm starting at negative three pi, I'm going to three times pi, and the step size is pi. So in this case, I'm gonna have, it's gonna update now where I have negative three pi, 
and then negative two pi and then negative pi. So I'm going in an integral of pi. So if I run that, then all of these other ticks show up. So it's basically like a shortcut? Yeah, yeah. Okay. It's faster to, to do it that way. Cool. Thank you. Mm -hmm. Okay, so let's uh, actually, I will keep that one. Then I'm going to comment that. Okay, so let's go ahead with this uh, kind of plot that we have here and these tick labels. So something else that we might want to do is have an angle for the tick labels. So we'll first do it and then I'll talk about why it might be helpful. So to have an, an angle for the tick labels, all we have to do is x tick if we're on the x axis, x tick and then angle. And then we specify whatever angle we want to have. So often we're either going to have it just be kind of horizontal like it, like it is by default, or we would want a 45 degree angle. So if we do that, then they all turn by 45 degrees. And it's, uh, it's just going to look like this. So for this plot here, it looks kind of weird, but I just want to show you how you can do it. So for, for our project, this will be useful. So, um, so for the project, let's say that we're plotting uh, COVID case data and we're doing it by state or something. So if we have all of our states that are on the x-axis, it would be kind of, it wouldn't show up well if we have the state name and we're plotting it by default where each tick corresponds to the state name. So if we did it that way, they would just they would keep overlapping. So to fix that, we can add an angle of 45 degrees, and then they would all kind of show up. But in this case, they want to overlap. So it would be helpful to do this x tick angle kind of function. Okay, so there's a question, can we do this on the on the y-axis as well. And yeah, we could do the same for the y-axis. So uh, yeah, we could do that. So I can change, we can do it for uh, y ticks. That's that's an option. So see, we, we have y ticks and then the documentation just showed up. In this case, I'm not gonna change anything because, well, I guess I can. I'll do y ticks, uh, we'll do negative three in this case, we'll do a step size of 0 0.5, and then we'll go to 3. And then if I run that, then you see that our Y ticks, they update to have more ticks. Okay. So leave it like that. So again, for the project, it'll be useful to put our tick labels at an angle because if we have like a, a state name or a county name, whatever it might be. If we have a lot of them, uh, then they're going to overlap by default. But if we put it at an angle, then they're all going to be, uh, it's going to be much more readable that way. And we can do that for Y ticks as well. Question, are we ever going to use this like in like a 3D dimensional versus just 2D? Uh, we'll talk about 3D plots. Um, Actually, I guess I don't have a slide on that, but we might talk about 3D plotting sometime, but probably just going to stick to 2D plotting for the for the most part. Okay. okay, so we can also change our tick labels to correspond to like some other kind of formatting type. So let's say we want to we want to show it as if we we're plotting something for like currency we can uh, add in a dollar sign kind of automatically. So for that, we just change the format that we have for the ticks. Okay, so let's do that right now. So we'll make a new plot here. Okay. Uh, we'll change this to a uh, tick format. This will be the section. Okay, so we're gonna make this plot that I have in the slides. So we're gonna make just some vector here that's going to represent some profit. It, it doesn't matter really. So I'm gonna make a random vector. So I wanna have 
uh, integers from 20 to 100. And then the actual vector I'm going to define is going to be um, one row and 10 columns. OK, so just to kind of refresh you on that, that's just this vector right here. So it's a, a 1 by 10 double. So it's one row and 10 columns of just random numbers that are integers from 20 to 100. So really, you, you know, you can have whatever vector you want here. It doesn't matter. OK, so here I'm going to do a, a new type of plot that we haven't talked about. So I'm going to do stem and profit, and that's going to make a stem plot for us. So as this is what a stem plot looks like. We just have a, a vertical line, and then it's going to go up to a data marker. Uh, by default, it's going to be a circle. OK, and then there's uh, other plots as well. So let's actually, we'll show that right here. So there's a stem plot, and we can also make a, a bar plot. So I'll do bar, and then I'll put in profit. And now we have a, a kind of a bar plot here that's uh, shown basically the same thing that we just did. This time, they're obviously just bars. So uh, this will be something that we probably will use a lot on the project as well. OK, but let's go back to the stem, to the stem plot, just because that's what we have in the slide. And there was, um, I had a slide, I think, earlier on here where I mentioned other plots that you can have. Uh, I don't know which slide it was on. Okay, but there, there's some slide where I mentioned them. I'm not sure. You can look at the documentation as well. OK, so anyways, we have our plot. Let's get that back up. So if I want to change the y-axis labels here to a dollar sign, I can do that. So all I have to do is y-tick format. And then in uh, apostrophes, I'm going to put USD for um, American dollars. And then I can run it. And now we have a dollar sign in front of each number here. OK, so if you look at this plot, you'll see that our first entry and our last entry, they're kind of hard to read because they're, they're on the limit that we have for our x axis. So we can modify that as well. We can type in x lim. That's going to be our x limits. And then we're going to put in a left parentheses because now we're going to define what we want our limits to be. And I'm going to use brackets because I'm defining a vector here, or not a vector, but rather two values that are going to be the, the minimum value for our x axis and then the maximum value. So right now, by default, MATLAB has it as 1 and 10. I want to change that to 0 and 11 so there's some spacing on the side. So now if I run it, now there's spacing on the side. I can see all of our plots uh, much more better, much better, yeah. OK, any questions on on this slide? Uh, what does the x lim mean again? That's going to change the, the limits that we have on the x axis. So by default, it was from 1 to 10. So x lim just means specify what you want the minimum value to be for the x-axis and what you want the maximum value to be for the x-axis. Oh, OK, thank you. Mm -hmm. oh, I just randomly thought of this, too. I don't think I mentioned it when we started class. I created all of your quizzes and your homework last night. So I don't know if you get an email for that automatically or not, but all of the, the grades for the last quiz are up. OK. Yeah, you got an email? All right. Uh, next exercise, then we'll talk about the ruler object. OK. So this will allow us to modify, basically, properties of, of, some, of some plot that we have.
Okay, so let's do that. We'll type in a new section here, ruler objects. Okay, so the main thing that I'm gonna show you here is modifying our axis here, our Y axis to display a whole number instead of having some number raised to a power, in this case, 10 to the fourth. So again, for the project, this might be useful. By default, MATLAB, they always like to have this kind of format here, where if you have a large number, it's gonna have just a, a single digit here, or there's some, some digit on the left side here, and it'll be raised to some power. So if you have a really large number or a really small number, they're often gonna use this format where they uh, raise your numbers to some power. And that can be kind of uh, annoying. So for a project, again, if we have a lot of cases, which of course, unfortunately we do in the US, it's gonna be raising it to a power. And uh, we wanna see just the whole number so we can modify that. So let's make a new graph here. So we'll do x equals one space. We're gonna go from zero to five. And this time I'm going to specify a length for this vector of 1000. So we're gonna have 1000 values in this vector. And then we'll do y equals 100. It's kind of a cool plot. 100 times e e to the sine of 10 times x. Okay, so this is 100 times e to the sine of 10x. Can you see here that um, I'm doing element by element multiplication because we have two vectors here. We have x times sine of, sine of 10x. Okay. So we're gonna do plot x comma y. You see this pretty cool plot. And so just like in the slide, we have our numbers here and they're raised to the power of 10 to the fourth or well, times 10 to the fourth. Okay, so we wanna change that. So we have a whole number. So what do we do? We can modify a property for the y axis. So by convention, this is what we often do. We define, um, I guess we should do a Y. So a Y is just kind of by convention, axis Y, and then we'll do GCA. So GCA, what is that? That means get current axis. So if I type in a Y, actually that should show up. We'll do, we'll do this. Okay, maybe it's not gonna show up, but um, so for that, you might need to type in uh, properties of, of AX. I'm trying to remember just by, from what I was doing before. Um, there, there's two different commands. So one of them is summary of AX. Now that won't work. Properties of AX. Okay, so this kind of works. So here are our properties for our axis. So there's a ton of stuff here. And this is basically everything that we can change. So uh, X label, we changed that before. Uh, X tick, we changed that before. Y ticks, uh, Y tick labels. So there's a ton of stuff here that we can change. So what we wanna change here is a component of the Y axis. Yeah. Question? Yes. Um, how come when I type in in AX to the command window, I just get unrecognized function or variable? Yeah, so I got that as well up here. So we, I instead typed properties of AX to get all this to show up. Still didn't like that. Um, okay, so you can stay after class and share your screen with me, and then we can kind of go over it. It should uh, show up just like I have it here. All right. Okay, so now we're going to do, uh, so we want to modify our graph here to have whole numbers. So we're going to do ax.yaxis. 
So right now we're going to modify some property of our y axis and make sure you have this capitalization correct because MATLAB uh, it pays attention to your capitalization and then we're going to set that equal to zero. Now if we run this, then we're going to have whole numbers for this graph. Okay, so all we did here, uh, we did ax dot y axis dot exponent. So that's accessing this variable here that we just defined that was called ax. And then we're going to modify a property of the y axis, in this case, the exponent. And we're going to set that equal to zero because we don't want our numbers here to be raised to a power. Okay, any questions on that? Okay. Okay, so logarithmic plots. This may also be useful for the for the project. Okay, Ryan, that's good. So logarithmic plots. All right, so a log scale that's going to be used to represent a large range of data, and we can also use a log plot to um, identify trends in some data that we have. So uh, you probably saw on for for COVID cases in the U.S., a lot of the plots were on a uh, using a log axis because there are so many cases. Okay, so we have two different types of log plots that we can do. We can do log log. That's going to have a log scale on both axes. Or we can do semi-log, which will have a log scale on only one axis. Okay, so here's the syntax. We do log log of x and y. So again, both axes will be logarithmic. Or we can do semi-log x, and that'll just have the x scale. That'll be logarithmic. And the y scale is going to be rectilinear, so that's what we have by default. Or could you semi log y, and that'll have the y scale, that'll be logarithmic, and the x scale by default, that's going to be rectilinear, like we've been doing this entire time. Okay, so we're going to type this out, this lovely equation here. Uh, so I guess this will be maybe some just good practice to type out a terrible equation, I don't know. So we're going to have our x domain that'll go from 0 0.1, a uh, step size of 0 0.01, and we're going to go to 100. Okay, so maybe you just want to look at my screen to see the equation that we're typing out. So we're going to do square root of 100, and then times, we're using array multiplication here, times 1 minus 0 0.01 times x squared, and that's going to be squared, plus 0 0.02 times x, that's squared, and then we're going to divide that entire top term by 1 minus x squared, move this down, that's going to be squared plus 0 0.1 times x, and that's squared. All right, if you typed it out, I don't know, kind of amazed, because you, you can just watch this if you want. All right, so we have x and y, and okay, so we're going to make a, we're going to use a subplot here so we can compare our two different graphs. So we're going to have on our first graph, that's going to be a rectilinear plot. And then on the other one, we're going to show a log log plot. OK, so let's do subplot. So our first one, that's going to be rectilinear. So remember from last time, to define a subplot, we use subplot. Then we specify the amount of rows that we have. So that's going to be 1. And then we specify the amount of columns that we have. It's going to be two in this case because we want two graphs. And then the last part is the position that we want. So we want to have this, uh, this plot on the first pane. 
Okay, so I'm going to do plot x comma y. This will be the rectilinear plot. And I use a line width of 1.5. And then I'm going to put in a title here just so we know what we're looking at. Rectilinear plot. And then I'm also going to define the, the range that we have for the axis. So I'm going to have our x-axis go from 0 0.1 to 100. That's the, that's the range that we defined earlier here. So 0 0.1 to 100. And then our y limits, we're going to have 0 to 35. So earlier on in the class, we had this, this kind of function right here, which was x lim. And that's basically what we also have inside of here. So using the axis command, we can change the x limit and the y limit just on one line. So right here, highlighted 0 0.1 to 100. We could also use the, the, the function x limb to define that. And then we could do y limb to define is 0 to 35. But I'm going to use this on, on one line. So I'm going to do it in one command here, uh, or one function, which is the axis function. OK, so we have that. Let's, uh, let's plot this right now. And this is what our plot looks like. So it's uh, very hard to determine what we're looking at um, because, of this, uh, because of the nature of our function here, which is raised to you know, we have a lot of stuff raised to a power. So it makes it very hard to actually see what we have in this plot. So instead, it would be better to use a log log plot to better visualize this data. All right, so let's do that. We're going to make uh, a new plot here. So subplot 1, 2, 2. We want it to be on the second pane. Um, OK, and then I'm going to define x log. So this is going to basically be a different x domain for this plot. So I'm going to have x log. And just like we have lint space. So lint space, what is that? That's a vector, like a, a linear vector. So in this case, we're going to have x log. And just like we can define lint space, we're going to type in log space now. So that's going to be um, a basically a vector that's defined logarithmically. So we'll do log space of negative 2 to 2. And then we're going to have 500 elements. And then we're also going to define y log. So that'll be log space of, or sorry, we're not defining log space. We're going to find our x domain right here. So y log, that's going to be our function. Um, so that's basically what we already defined up here. Uh, so we are going to change a few things within that function because we we need to use this log space that, that we just defined right here. So before we do that, we can take a look at that vector. So x log, you click on that. Uh, this is what it's going to look like. So we have 500 elements in this vector. And again, it's defined uh, logarithmically. Okay, so I'm just going to select Y and I'm going to copy and paste it. And we have to make a few changes here. So instead of X, now we need to put in X log because that's our logarithmic X domain. So X log, log, X log. All right, so if I plot this now, we have our two pins, so we have our rectilinear plot, and this is still empty because we still need to plot it. Okay, because we're plotting log logarithmic data, we need to use log log. And then I'm going to specify x log, that's going to be our x domain. And then our y domain, that's going to be, I should call this y log. That's going to be y log. Then we can use a line width of 1.5. And then title, that'll be log, log, plot. 
Okay, and now if we run this, this is uh, what we get here. Let me move this. Okay, so we're going from, in this case, negative 100 to 100. And uh, in this case, our plot here, it's much more representative of the data that we have. So in this uh, rectilinear plot, it's kind of all smushed to the left-hand side. And we can't really see what the plot is actually looking like. Um, so it's still going to 100 here, but um, all of the, a lot of the plot is kind of smushed to the left-hand side here. So using this log log plot, it's a, it's a better way in this case to visualize this plot. All right, so that was kind of a lot to, to type out. Um, so you, you probably won't use log plots too often, but again, for the project, it might be useful. You might want to do it um, for like case data. So in that case, you would all you'd have to do is change one of the axes to be a logarithmic axis. So you just, uh, you know, you do like semi-log uh, y, and then you plot your, your data. Okay, so these are just some reminders for a logarithmic, logarithmic plot. Uh, you can read through this if you want. So we can not plot a negative number for a log plot. Um, so we have a log of a negative number is going to be zero. And uh, we can't plot the number zero on a log plot. Log base 10 of zero, that's going to be the natural log of zero, which is negative infinity. And the tick mark labels are the actual values being plotted. So we already kind of talked about this, but uh, 10 to the negative two, well, that's going to be 0 0.01. And then 10 squared, that's going to be 100. Okay, so plotting behavior for a log plot. So we already kind of saw that in the plot that we just made. But if we have an exponential function and we want to produce a straight line, then we're going to use a semi-log plot. Okay. Um, so in this case, this is semi-log y, and that's going to produce this straight line. I thought I had uh, maybe an example, but I, I guess not. And then if we have a power function, that's going to produce a straight line on a log-log plot. Okay, so this is the slide that I was talking about earlier for other plots that we have inside of MATLAB. So there's um, stairs. I don't think I've ever used that. Bar, uh, we're going to use that for the for our project. And then stem, which we saw earlier for the slide um, with the with the money. OK. So we got a little more time. So we're going to be able to finish this. And then I'll probably be able to show some an intro to importing data. So two y axes on a plot. So. Sometimes we want to plot two things on one graph, and we want to have two y-axes for the plot. So you see here we're plotting 3 times cosine of x and 5 times 2 sine of x, or sorry, 5 times sine of 2x. And on the left-hand side, we have a y-axis that's going from negative 3 to 3. That's corresponding to 3 times cosine of x. And then on the right-hand side, we have a y-axis that's going from negative 5 to 5, and that's for 5 sine of 2x. OK, so this uh, this blue plot, again, that's going from negative 3 to 3 because our amplitude is 3. And on the right-hand side, uh, we're going from negative 5 to 5 because for that function, our amplitude is 5. So in this case, they both show up taking up the same amount of space um, even though their amplitudes are different. So let's go over how we can do this. So we'll make a little section here, we'll call it two y axes. Okay, we'll define our vector. So our x domain, we're going to use the lens space command. We'll do negative two times pi to two pi. 
and the length of our vector we'll use 100 and eh, i don't like that we'll, we'll use a thousand so that's going to be 1000 data points within that vector x okay so let's get our function so we have y1 and y2 so we have y1 that's three times cosine of x and y2 that's going to be five times sine of two times x I don't know why I did that. Okay, so let's plot this right now. So we'll do plot x comma y1. Hold on. Plot x comma y2. Oh, okay, I need to comment this out because we still have a subplot kind of stored in the memory of MATLAB. Okay, so here is our graph by default. It looks kind of bad. Okay, so here we have our plot. So in blue, that's three times cosine of x. And then in red, that's five times sine of two x. Okay, so let's make this uh, look a bit better. So the first thing we're gonna do is let's change the x limit. Okay, so we're gonna make that, um, this x limit from negative two pi to two pi since that's the x domain that we defined up top here. So we'll do negative 2 times pi and then 2 times pi. Now if we run it, now this plot already looks better. So before our x limit by default, that was from negative 8 to 8. And now we're going to change that limit to negative 2 pi to 2 times pi. Okay, since we're plotting a, um, a sinusoidal functions here, let's uh, change this to have our x ticks um, from negative 2 pi to 2 pi. So we're going to type x ticks negative 2 times pi. And then we want to use a step size of pi to 2 times pi. So now our ticks, they're going to be in terms of kind of a uh, integers of pi. So this is a good example of when we'd want to have maybe um, our x tick labels at an angle. So we're going to change this. So just like before, it's going to say, it's going to be the simple for pi. But uh, let's say that we didn't want to do that for some reason, and we wanted to keep it as these integer values here. So I can't read them too well because they're being they're overlapping each other. So I can do x tick angle and I'll do 45. Now if I run it, I can read everything quite easily for each x tick that we have. Um, for the sake of time, I'm actually not gonna type out our x tick label since we did that earlier on in the class, and that's just gonna take up some time. So instead we're gonna focus on the the two y axes that we can define. Okay. So instead of plotting like we did here where I did plot x comma y1 and hold on and then plot x comma y2, we're gonna do this a little bit differently. We're gonna do y y axis and then left. So now I'm saying, I'm telling MATLAB that I'm about to make a plot and that I want this y-axis to be on the left-hand side of the plot. Okay, so now I'll do plot x comma y1. Now if I run this, um, this should be on the left, but I also need to find y, y-axis right, and then we'll plot x comma y2. Let's run that. What's, uh, what's the issue? One, three, five. Oh, okay, it's still taking stuff from earlier on in our in our script. So typically, I define each plot. I'll actually specify a figure. I have it here because we've been overriding stuff, but MATLAB is kind of throwing a fit for it. So let's uh, comment all this stuff out from earlier on. And if you don't remember to comment this stuff out, I'm doing, I'm highlighting it and then doing control R. 
It might, and it's different on a Mac. I forget what it is, but someone mentioned it last class. Okay, there we go. So now this is showing up correctly since we commented all that stuff out. Okay. Okay, so here we, I'm just plotting one right now, and that's a y1. So on the left-hand side, we have our range going from negative three to three, which is what we want because we're plotting uh, y equals three times cosine of x. So that's going from negative three to three. Now I need to specify the right y-axis. So I'll do that. So I put y, y axis right. So I'm going to MATLAB, I'm going to plot something. And I want you to specify the right hand side axis for this corresponding plot here. So we do plot x comma y2. And y2, that's five times sine of two times x. So our, our y limit here is gonna be from negative five to five since the amplitude is five. Okay, are there any questions on this so far? Change the line width to. Okay. So for whatever reason, I, I could change this to, um, to change the the uh, the y limits as well. So this would be similar to what we'd have if we just did our plot like up here, where we had plot x comma y one, then hold on plot x comma y two. Let's clear that. All right. So here, this is what our plot looks like, just by I'll say by default for our usual way of plotting our functions. So I'll uncomment this. Okay, so from our method right here of using two different y axes, by default it's going to scale each plot to its um, to its kind of default behavior to fill the window. So. By doing this, uh, even though our amplitudes are different, they are both fitting this, uh, this graph that we have. So I could change that by using what we talked about earlier on. I can change the, um, in this case, the y limb, so the y limits. So to do that, I'm going to change it on the same line right here. So I'm gonna have plot x comma y one and then I'm going to change the y limits uh, as well. So I'm going to go over here and I'm going to add on y limb. I can change that to, I guess uh, in this case, I changed it to negative four to four. So right now our y limit for y1, that's from negative three to three. So for whatever reason, let's say we wanted to change it to negative four to four then we can do that. And now it's scaled a bit differently. So we have negative four to four. I can also change the one, the y limits for the, for y2. Maybe I want to make that negative six to six. There we go. And then I can change that uh, as well. Okay, any questions on plotting two functions with two different y-axes. <clears throat> okay. All right, I know that was kind of uh, a lot of stuff today. So we're gonna add on though. We're gonna do, we have time for a little bit more which will be a quick intro on how to import stuff, uh, import files into MATLAB.
Okay, so I'm going to change my folder here. Okay, so all of this stuff here, there, there are files that I'm going to give you uh, for the project. So I have data for California, and I'm going to add some more here. But so far, I have data for California. So we have just by cases, by age, by ethnicity, by sex, um, testing data for California, um, confirmed cases for the US, population by county, global uh, COVID deaths. And then I have more data for um, for the US by state. And then uh, deaths for the US, uh, cumulative deaths. So there's a whole lot of data here. So I'm going to close out of that script. I'll make a new script here. Okay, so we have all these tables. So let's, let's just open one up here. I'm going to double click on it. And I know you don't have this data yet, but I'm just going to show you what to do. So by double clicking on this file over here, I can see this table, make a full screen. So this is a CSV file. And so we have our columns here. We have county, um, should be able to drag that. Total count confirmed. So these are our cases that are confirmed by county. Total count deaths by county, and then total count confirmed. Um, that's for the for the deaths, I think, and then new count deaths. So, um, and it's doing this by date. So, so we have all of this data. We have quite a lot. Um, do they show the size here? I don't see where it shows the size here, but. Uh, let's see, we're going to import it and then we can see the size once we import it, but it's a lot of data. Okay, so how do we import this data? We're going to first, let's just make a random title, importing data in MATLAB. So uh, next time I'll actually give you some files so you can import them along with me. And uh, I always start out a script by clearing the memory. So now I want to import data. So I'm going to make a section, call it import data. And again, we're going to use a function that's called read table. So I'm going to call this Cali cases. That's going to be our variable that's going to store our table. And I'm going to type in read table. And in apostrophes, I have to specify the data that I want to import. So in this case, it's going to be cases from California. So Cali underscore cases dot CSV. So I have to specify the entire name, including the file type. Okay, let's press that. So let's run it. Let's uh, call this class importing. And now in the workspace, I get this table here and the value. So we have, in this case, we have uh, 1,200 rows and six columns. So I can double click on it. And then this is going to show us the table inside of the workspace. So we have 1,200 rows. I mean, yeah, that's a lot of data. So it's, uh, it's by county here. All right, and so that's how we're going to import data into MATLAB. And then next time we'll talk about, we'll go over this again. And then we'll talk about how we can kind of sort through the data and manipulate it in a way that's easier for us to extract the data that we want to, to look at or to plot. All right, and, I, and again, I'll upload uh, some files for you so you can follow along with me. All right, so we're pretty much out of time. So uh, just to recap some important things, we're going to have a quiz next Wednesday. I'm going to upload homework uh, sometime, hopefully by the end of tonight. Um, and that'll be due next Wednesday by 11.59 PM. But I'll post the solutions for the homework uh, probably on this coming Monday. So. You know, theoretically, yeah, you can just copy the homework, but it's in your best interest to actually 
do the homework yourself first. And your quizzes that uh, from last week, last week, I think so, uh, they, they're graded. So that's up right now. All right, so that's all I have today. I'll see you guys on Monday. If you have any questions, then just stick around. Thank you, Professor. Have a good day. Yep, have a good weekend. Thank you. Yep. Professor, I do have a question about one of the 